we can get started. Uh, there's just a minute left, so we can get going. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming uh, to uh, the Applied AI Summit. Uh, we've done a, uh, at least one of these before, and uh, we're excited to have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, all of you join. Hopefully, so this is the second time for some of you. Uh, uh, my name is Bindu Reddy. I'm the CEO co-founder of uh, uh, Abacus AI. Uh, today, we're mostly going to be discussing uh, uh, about the uh, science of enterprise AI. So that's the theme of the summit. Uh, we're very fortunate to, to have the summit kicked off by uh, two very uh, illustrious people, um, Peter Norvig uh, and Alon Halavi. Uh, Peter and Alon are going to be having a fireside chat about the uh, um, the evolution of machine learning over time. So the past, the present, and the future of machine learning. Uh, I don't know if you have seen some of Peter's uh, videos. They're very informative and, uh, and very interesting. Alone as somebody whom uh, you know I've worked with before is a, a legend uh, in terms of like uh, uh, conversational language AI and so on. So I'm sure we'll enjoy the talk. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to take too much of my uh, of the time talking about them. I'd rather have them talk. So uh, we should get started. Peter and Alon, take it away. Uh, and again, uh, recommend switching to speaker view so you can actually uh, you know uh, uh, you know see them on video as well. And uh, Taylor, if you want to like turn off the screen share, uh, we could get going. Okay. Hey, Elon, how are you? Good, how are you, Peter? I'm good. It's uh, wow. good to see you, good to be here together. I'm sorry we can't all be together in person. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm kind of glad because I'm looking in the chat and seeing where everybody's coming from, and they're coming from all over the world. And I think if we were in person, uh, many of them wouldn't get the chance to uh, join us today. So welcome to all of you. That is true. Uh, it's, it's, I always enjoy uh, talking with you because you always wear a very colorful shirt. And I can't <laughs> see the entire shirt this time. So that's, that's one downside. First rule of Zoom is uh, never pan down because you don't know what sweatpants or whatever people are wearing. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could talk about. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, you know, I remember recently uh, fusion tables shut down. That was the work you did a long time ago. And I had some data up and I had to find another place to host it when it ended. But yeah. what, what do you think the state is now of this idea of uh, data sharing? Uh, and uh, it's not infusing tables now. Who's doing that well? And, and where do you see that going? Yeah, that's a great question. So just in terms of background, fusion tables, which started in 2009 or something like that, was an attempt to make uh, data much more easy for people to find and to share and to, to manipulate together. So it was a web-based tool. You can upload data, you can put it on a map, uh, you could share it with your friends so they can edit some cells and you can edit some cells. Um, and then you can combine it with other data, uh, with other uh, data sources. Um, you know, um, today, so there's, you know, so, so Google uh, GIS uh, has a tool that does some of this today. Um, not, not the full, all the full capabilities that, that Fusion Tables had. But I'm asking myself, so, so the idea at the time was we need to make it more easy to share data. Um, today, the situation I think is a little different in the sense that uh, there are already very good tools for finding data online. So actually Google has um, Google Data Search, which you can uh, find uh, a, lot of, a lot of data sets online. Now, <clears throat> the part of the, the tooling part where you go in and you, you actually work with the data you know, I think tools have improved um, enough that maybe that's not a big, as big a gap as it was in 2008, where um, where the masses couldn't really uh, work very well with data. But that's that's my impression. I don't know. I can't back that up with too many uh, um, experiences that people are having right now. What is your impression? Yeah, I think uh, that uh, there's a lot more data available, like you say. I think we can, we're in better shape when it comes to finding it. 
I still think there's a lot of work to understand what to do with it. Uh, I think we could use better tools for uh, regularization, uh, you know, figuring out names of people and companies and so on when they're spelled slightly differently. Uh, there's, there's room for that. Uh, and I think I see uh, coming competition among uh, the various providers. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the big cloud providers, as well as uh, smaller companies uh, like Abacus and so on of, of saying, who's going to help you manage all this? And, and where's that all going to come from? Uh, and I guess I'm also seeing uh, something that I'm really happy to see, which is a shift from the idea of when you start a new project, the first thing you do is gather data from scratch to the idea of, well, maybe the data already exists out there. And I think that's most true for natural language computer vision, where we can say there are these big models out there that have been pre-trained uh, and now we can take one of those and then retrain it on your specific data and it performs well. Uh, and those are, those are really the first examples where you could do that. Where you could start with somebody else's work rather than start from scratch on your own. And so I would like to see more of that, uh, more capability to use something that's already been built rather than have to start from scratch. Right, the, sec the second part of that is there are a lot more data sets today where when you come up with a new technique, you can try it out to see whether you're improving the state of the art, which compared to yeah. say the, even 10, 15 years ago uh, is, is a huge is a huge advance, right? Um, right. So that's, that's driving, that's making things go much faster today. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of papers that you see that are actually proposing new data sets uh, or new ways of taking existing data sets, adding more annotations to them so you can actually you know, work on a different task. Um, so that's a, a, that's a fine kind of paper to say, publish at ACL these days. Right, right. And, and I see that's, that's been a change uh, just over uh, the, the course of, uh, of our careers. You know, I remember uh, when I was in uh, graduate school, the typical paper was, uh, you know, I have this new algorithm and isn't it really neat and cool? Yeah. But we didn't, we wouldn't evaluate it <laughs> with data. We, you, it would be evaluated by how elegant the theory was. Right. Uh, not by whether it actually worked. And then right. people started to put together data sets and now uh, you were forced to say, gee, I, I thought my theory was really elegant, but it performed <laughs> terribly. <laughs> so yeah. I need something else. Uh, yeah. And that was a shift that I think happened in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, and it's being carried through. It is. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we went back to the year uh, 2009. And uh, another thing that happened that year is uh, you and I got to work together along with uh, Fernando Pereira. And we wrote this paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. And uh, I think that's been one of our more cited papers. Uh, so uh, where do you think we stand now? Uh, a decade later. We were right. No, I mean, now it's all <laughs> GPT-3, right? I mean, that's uh, GPT-3 solves everything. And, and it's basically reading, reading a huge amount of data and, um, you know, has, uh, I don't know, two, two bill, I don't know how many parameters in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, the, the latest Google model is up to the trillion level. So yeah, I saw that. Big, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I, I think we had a good call there. Uh, you know, because the, the title mentioned data in general, but the article is really mostly about language models. Uh, and one of the pull quotes we had was, uh, for many tasks, words and word combinations provide all the representational machinery we need to learn from text. So I think, I think we really called that right. And I think we were uh, kind of reacting against this dichotomy that at the time people was said, well, there's two approaches. Either you do, you count, statistics of n-grams of words, and that's a very shallow representation, or you do a deep representation, sort of deep, not in the sense of deep learning, because uh, that word didn't exist then, but <laughs> you know, complex in the form of you've got a parse tree and you have a semantic logical representation. And we were, I think we were trying to say, no, it's not, uh, it's not 
a, a simple dichotomy like that, that you can do statistics over lots of different types of representations. And I think yeah. we called that right. Uh, maybe we didn't quite see the importance of word embeddings, which I think was a big step uh, towards making these large models work. Uh, but we had the idea that, uh, no, you didn't need to write logical translations of every sentence, uh, that there's a lot of data in the text itself and a lot can come out of that. And, and so yeah. maybe the idea is too obvious now. Maybe, maybe now we need to write another uh, paper that talks about the areas of ineffectiveness. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, let's, let's do it. But I, I still have, um, so what, what I love language models and they're, they're amazing, but I don't feel like we have a good understanding of what they do and how they do it. So for example, there's yeah. a lot of work on you know, knowledge models are actually databases. They, they can tell you that London is the capital of the UK. Will they tell you what is the capital of Malawi? I don't know. What, what is the value of a database whose completeness or correctness, I don't know. And how is that knowledge used? So if I ask you, uh, you know, if I say, you know, Joe lives in London, and then I ask you, does, does he live in the UK? Will that the fact that you know the UK uh, London is in the UK sort of right. be part of the derivation, and I'll get the answer? Will that always be true? Will that be true for certain kinds of of uh, uh, reasoning patterns? That kind of understanding is um, is just starting, and I'm being generous. Is just starting to yeah. to emerge. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right that we have no idea what's going to work and what's not going to work. And, you know, very similar questions. Uh, one will get an amazingly correct answer and one will get an amazingly wrong answer. Uh, you know, yeah. and I was especially interested in areas where we go outside of, uh, you know, this simple, uh, what's the capital of, of England questions. And some of the things I've seen are things like uh, write a JavaScript program for me. Right, so you can say, uh, make a program where there's a yellow button that says hello world when you click it, and it will get that right, it's incredible. Uh, but then you say something slightly different and it's completely wrong. Uh, and you know, and likewise, just you can say, uh, you know, how much is 23 times 42, and it will get that right. Uh, but then you do a three or four digit number and it gets something completely wrong. Uh, Okay. So we really have no idea of what the boundaries are and, and what it will get right and, and what it won't. Uh, and so there's certainly a lack of trust uh, if you're going to use these for any application that really matters, right? If the company was trying to use it as their okay. customer support, uh, I would be very worried yep. that it could do a lot of things wrong. Uh, and then there's also a scientific question of, why is it so great at some of these and why is it so bad at other ones? Uh, and we, I don't think we understand that at all. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I go back to this analogy of uh, the movie uh, Being There where uh, Peter Sellers uh, played this kind of uh, idiot savant who, uh, who rose in society because he dressed well. Uh, <laughs> And he didn't really understand what he was talking about, but, uh, you know, so he was this simple uh, gardener who really didn't understand politics, but he was drawn into the world of politics and they would ask him, you know, uh, what do you think of the coming economic crisis? And he would say, oh, uh, if you plant the seeds, they will grow. And he was, oh, that's so profound. That's a metaphor for, uh, for where we are in the economic crisis. So you must be right. Yeah. Uh, and actually, he had no idea, but he knew how to associate and say something sensible. And we would uh, uh, project onto that deeper understanding. So I think that's a lot of what's happening with these language models, that they're just saying something coherent that, yeah. like you said, they kind of memorize something and they come up with something, uh, but they're not really understanding what they're doing. Uh, right. And Another uh, problem is they will always find something to fill in. So they, you, you, they'll never say, no, I don't have anything to put in here. Yeah. I, yeah. I, know, I know that this question doesn't make sense. Go away. No, yeah. they will always, in the vast knowledge that they have, they will always put something in, in, a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a mask that you, you give them. Yeah. And knowing what you don't know 
is actually crucial in order to to uh, to have some sort of reliability. There's another. I mean, your example with the multiplication of numbers, right? Um, you could argue, you know, we know how to multiply numbers. We have we have great machinery for multiplying num multiplying numbers and even taking square roots. That shouldn't be something that a, a language model should even be trying to do. Uh, yeah. For that matter, I could argue, you know, trying to memorize the list of capitals of countries in the world is we've got a database for that. We've got the UN. They're working on it. We, we, <laughs> they can give us the, the 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 spreadsheet. Okay, we don't need to read the web in order to um, in order to know this stuff. What is more interesting is if you say, you know, um, can you see my water bottle? What is a water bottle used for? Okay, that knowledge is not taxonomic in the same way that, you know, um, a water bottle is a container. You know, the fact that you can throw this on, a, uh, on, on an annoying neighbor or uh, use it as a paperweight, those are uses that, that is, that is something that I would love a, a language model. And I know people are working on this. That is something that that the knowledge that you read from the web is could be very um, useful to extract, but taxonomic knowledge that we we sort of have and and databases that we have sitting around, we already have that. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with that. And uh, although you know we've uncovered some criticism of these large models, uh, I would also like to see larger models, in the sense that I would like to see these uh, multimedia models. Right, so right now we have good computer vision models that have uh, millions of pictures in them and we have good language models, but I wanna combine them and, and I want to throw in videos as well. Yeah. Uh, because I think this, you know, finding out what you can do with a water bottle or finding out, uh, you know, what does a cat act like? Uh, there's more of that on YouTube than there is in text. For and sure. We, you shouldn't rely only on text if you want to have a better understanding of the world. You should combine everything. Uh, and I think the large cloud providers and, and open AI and so on will be going in that direction. And we may see a future where when you want to get started with a project, you subtract from one of these big models rather than try to build up from scratch. That, uh, I, um, I totally agree with that. And, and there are people working on this. The, the, the quest, one question is, is the language model that the parameters, is that the ultimate representation that we have uh, for the knowledge that we're capturing? I mean, in the good old days, right? Knowledge representation was a, a respectable field of AI. Um, yeah. it's, <laughs> it, um, it may not be as prominent right now, but it feels like, representing all the knowledge that we have as weights in a multi-trillion parameterized model may not be the, the all right. end all of, of AI. Yeah, yeah, we, we need something there as well. So let's see. Uh, so actually, actually should, um, Go ahead. Should, we, should we follow up on this a little bit? Our, our, our sim, is some notion of symbolic AI or some symbols that we agree on and actually have a meaning to somebody who's looking at them, are they gonna make a comeback somewhere? What, what would you think about that? I think we, uh, you know, we sort of have symbols in that we, we can communicate with these things with words and words are symbols. Um, I think, when I think of symbolic AI, I think of two things. Uh, so one is that there's a taxonomy, that a symbol refers to an individual or a class. Uh, and that's good because you can make inference based on that, but it's also bad because there are plenty of classes that have uh, fuzzy boundaries. And I think uh, things like the word embeddings uh, do a better job of, of capturing that, right? So, you know, we, we sort of know what a city is and so on, but we're vague around the edges of the difference between a city and a town. And, uh, you know, and, and we know what a chair is, but uh, if you have a stump, you can sit on it. And is it a chair then or is it not? Uh, there's a lot of things that are vague. Uh, and so that's a weakness of trying to force everything into 
first order logic where right. predicates are either true or false. Then the other interesting thing is that you can do inference with these. And you know, because we you force them to be so specific, then you're guaranteed that the inferences work. Uh, and that works great if you know if you're doing trying to do inference with things like triangles that have uh, a distinct mathematical definition, but it breaks down around the edges when, when you have these uncertain things. So right. I would like to have some way where we get back sort of this ability to deal with a symbolic rule of uh, if X, then Y, but we're not limited by saying everything is definitely an X or definitely not an X. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how to do that, but uh, uh, I think that's an area of, of interest. Uh, one interesting project, uh, uh, Sarah Luz and Kristin Suzeki and some others were working on theorem proving. And they, uh, one way to look at it is that they broke down theorem proving into the mechanical part and the uh, sort of intuitive part, right? So we have great theorem provers that can crank out proofs uh, but uh, they get bogged down uh, with the exponential, exponential explosion of possibilities. Uh, so what these guys said was, uh, give me a description of a problem and I'll use a deep net to decide uh, which of my many axioms are likely relevant to this problem. And then I'll hand only that subset of axioms to the theorem prover. And therefore, if I chose correctly, it should be able to efficiently find a solution. Whereas if I let it use all the axioms, it would never get through that search. Uh, so I think that's a nice way of separating out saying I've got some, uh, you know, sort of hardcore straightforward inference mechanism. And then I've got this intuitive, maybe this is related uh, deep network mechanism and I can combine them together in this way. And, and that's just one way of combining them. And I think in the future we'll see other ways of combining those two parts. All right. Um, I see. I see huge potential in that. I mean, I see that in some sense the, the the neural models can be a very powerful backend to something that takes and 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 goes and does reasoning um, with you know in the, in the traditional way. So, for example, we we did some work recently on something we call neural databases, and it turns out that if you if you write a bunch of facts down in natural language, like, you know, um, Joe is married to Susan and Susan is a doctor. And you ask her, you ask the, the transformer to say, you know, is, uh, is Joe's wife a doctor? It, it will figure it out. So it knows actually how to take these facts, do what we say, what we call in, in databases a join. Okay. And, and the interesting part about this is that it's, you're not giving it tuples, you're giving it facts that are stated in natural language, which means you can say them any way you want and you can say them in whatever language you want. But when you, uh, when you give it some, a bunch of facts and uh, you know, about, about Susan's uh, and Joe's children, and you ask them, how many children do they have? It's like, sorry, I don't know about this because the counting part, you know, the mathematical reasoning that, that says, well, I mentioned these three kids, can you count and say, I've got three kids? That part, the transformer was not able to do. At least the, the state-of-the-art transformers that that we were we were trying them out on. So the the idea was, let's use the flexibility that uh, transformers do give us to get some conclusions out of language. But then, when you actually go to more mathematical or set-oriented reasoning, uh, we do that using techniques that that are tried and true. Yeah. So another thing I want to talk about, uh, you know, in our careers, uh, we've kind of spanned a lot of the top level domains. Uh, we spent time in .edu uh, and .com, and uh, I even spent a couple of years in .gov. Uh, what do you see as the differences and, and how does technology transfer work? And, you know, how are these uh, different institutes gonna contribute going forward in the future? Great question. Um... You know, a lot of the people who were with me in .edu are today at .com. So it's, yeah. um, that, the, the data is speaking. Um, same the same speaking. goes .gov, by the way. Uh, 
So I have a, a couple friends uh, from my days at NASA who were able to, I was able to congratulate uh, recently for the Perseverance landing, uh, but there's uh, more of them at Google than there are at NASA. <laughs> yes. Um, and, that, and that's an okay thing, right? Um, so actually, so, so there, there are multiple ways of thinking about this question. One way is to say, if you're a young, if you just finished your PhD, what should you choose? Should you go to um, a .edu or a .com? And I actually think that, again, depending on your, there is more, if you go to a, to a university, uh, it's easier to establish yourself as a member of the field. Because at the university, uh, you're essentially working on your agenda and you're, you're taking responsibility for, for students and for grants that you're writing and for, for a, a scientific agenda that you presumably will, will try to get tenure for uh, a few years after that. And by doing that, you're, um, you have a better chance of, of rising to prominence um, in, a, in, a, in an academic field. If you, when you join a company, there are a lot more people at that level that are joining with you. And, and fundamentally the projects you're working on are, are multi-person projects. And so you, you're gonna do interesting work and you're gonna be learning a lot and you're gonna be you know, uh, doing all these great things. But in terms of establishing a name for yourself, I think that's the slightly more tricky uh, route. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Uh, I had a slightly different take on it, you know, and I'm reminded of the old saying, uh, if you have to, to ask the price of something, you can't afford it. Uh, and I think uh, graduate school is like that. Right? <laughs> so if you're asking, should I go to graduate school, then probably the answer is no. But if you're saying, I really need to go to graduate school, then that's a great career and you should do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, you raise a good point, but but the way I describe it is, if you go to a company, uh, you know, in your first year, you're not going to get the choice of what project you want to work on. You're going to be told what to work on. But on the other hand, you can say, uh, okay, I got my my regular work done, and I'm interested in some other areas. Can I volunteer on this cool AI project? And the answer will probably be yes, and probably in less time than it takes to get a PhD, you'll have worked your way up so that you're now working on interesting AI projects. Uh, so if, if your goal is to be working in the field, I think you can do very well uh, in industry. If your goal is to be recognized as a leader in the field, then I agree with your point that going to uh, grad school might be the way to do it. Yeah, I was, I was actually referring to what happens after grad school. So. Uh... I was assuming you already went to grad school. And yeah. now the question is, should I join uh, as a junior member of technical staff? Go to grad school and then go to academia right. and, and stay in that route, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, people have been moving back and forth uh, much more. Uh, one of the nice things about our fields, right, is that you can move back and forth between uh, .com and .edu. And I think universities have adapted to that as well. Um, right. So I think we're we're actually at a pretty healthy place in that in that respect. Yep. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about is uh, I recently finished up uh, with Stuart Russell the fourth edition of the AI textbook, uh, and I want to talk about what's new. And of course, one of the things that that's new is deep learning had a big effect on the uh, language and vision chapters and, and other parts of the book. But another thing in some sense re really surprised me a little bit in that in earlier editions of the book, we said, uh, well, we're gonna define AI as maximizing expected utility. And you give me a utility function and this book is about all these cool algorithms that can help you maximize. In the fourth edition, we said, yeah, yeah, we got all these cool algorithms and they're neat. But really a lot of the time, the hardest part is figuring out what should my utility function be? 
what is it that I really want and what is uh, for the good and, and not harming other people and being fair and so on. And so a lot of the emphasis has shifted from saying, yeah, the utility function is just given to you to saying, figuring out what it should be. Uh, that's what the hard part is. Uh, and I see that as a, as a big change in the field. And I know uh, you've been working on uh, integrity and, and, and other areas. Uh, so I think you see that as, as important as well. It's hugely important. Um, and the, one of the problems with that is that the, you can't always measure the results, right? I mean, some of the, some of these decisions you have to make about, you know, societal good, societal good, right? So you wanna, you wanna take an example of, of uh, let's take a random social media company, right? And they're supposed to, you know, they're, they're giving you a recommendation, a set of recommendations of what posts to look at. What are the, what is the function? What is the objective, right? Um, and some of these, uh, some of these objectives can't be measured anytime soon, right? I mean, if you're saying we want to, we want to promote societal good, uh, societal good takes takes a long time to, to to happen and to be measurable, and that certainly won't be measurable by your AI systems uh, anytime soon. So you also need to align, right? In order to in order to uh, adapt and in order to learn. You need the data that is that is given to you by the users, right? The behavioral data to give you the signal that is important to be able to to, to change your your uh, ranking function, and that's a that's a huge challenge. Um, I don't know. A bunch of of, um, of social media companies are dealing with this issue right now. Um, in the work that we're doing, so. You alluded to the work on integrity. So integrity refers to the problem of uh, make, making sure that the content on social media does not violate uh, certain policies. So the, the usual examples of this are hate speech, which is uh, you're not supposed to say demeaning things against uh, protected groups. Uh, bullying, uh, misinformation is sort of a slightly different category. Uh, putting up content that is uh, not allowed like nudity or or guns or, or um, trying to sell uh, illegal drugs, um, all these things. So, so there, there are actually many, many aspects to integrity. Um, and so the, the integrity work is how do we, given that you have billions of, of posts per day and there's no way a human, you can hire enough humans to look at all of these things. Uh, AI systems are crucial in order to, uh, to try to intercept some of the inappropriate content um, before anybody sees it. Um, right now, the way it works is you, you write down these policies. So every company, Twitter and YouTube and, and Facebook has a, a place where you can go and see exactly the policies that they are trying to adhere to. Um, and you're trying to see whether you know, a particular post will violate one of these policies. And this is, this is fascinating AI research because it's, it, it, every, it, it builds on everything we were talking about before. It's deep language understanding. It's deep uh, vision understanding. It's deep uh, multimodal understanding because sometimes a meme can have a photo and a piece of text. Each one of them is completely benign, but when you put them together, it's clear that you're you know, calling for the destruction of a, of a, of a particular race, okay? And so uh, I think in, in one way, integrity is driving AI research in ways that, that uh, no other application is doing that. Um, and on the other hand, it's extremely crucial in order to, to have some sort of reasonable dialogue on, on social media. Yeah. But, but, but the other problem there, and, and that's I think what you were alluding to is that um, some of the decisions are, are subjective at the end of the day. There's no predicate that is either true or false that you can look at, right? It's, it's uh, um, at, at the end of the day, some of these decisions, you know, is this a hateful phrase? It depends on the experiences that you've had with, with that phrase and, and how you've seen it used in, in, in conversation and, uh, and in discourse. And to some people that one phrase will be uh, uh, hateful and, another, and, and the same phrase will not be hateful to others. And it depends on the context. And so it's really, Getting at the uh, um, 
this would be a really good Turing test, actually. It's like, <laughs> it's hard. And, uh, and I haven't spent as much time on, on that kind of work as you have, but, but I have spent time on uh, spam, uh, both on uh, email and, and web spam. Uh, and there, uh, all these same issues of its subjective and so on. But we also noticed a big uh, kind of game theoretic aspect to it of, uh, you know, you could use data to say, what's the best move I could do now to knock this stuff out? Uh, but we found that wasn't enough, that you had to be thinking ahead of, if I make this move, then what move are the bad guys going to make? And where yeah. will I be uh, two or three moves down the line? Uh, and that's hard to do because there is no data. We don't have any data from the future of uh, what are they going to do if we change our policies. So you have to guess uh, what's, what's going to happen. And you know maybe you could do some little simulations and we had some ability to do that. But the simulations always break down because you, you don't know for sure what's going to happen. So, so I think that's a limitation of, uh, of AI and working with data. Of, uh, and we unfortunately don't have any data from the future. Yeah, how are we going to solve that? Yeah. So <laughs> when you think about the next edition of your book, how is it going to be different? Can you can you imagine how it's going to be different from the, the one that you just finished? I think it might be a higher level, right? So, I mean, you know, we go into detail of uh, here's how uh, uh, we do back propagation and so on. And here's the partial differential equations and all that. I think in the future, there may be less of that saying, yeah, you know, that's a detail, but you don't need to know it. It's like saying, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna teach you to drive a car, but uh, you don't have to know uh, how the engine works. Uh, you just have to know how to use it. Uh, and I think there may be maybe more going in that direction. You're trying to make it a little thinner. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that hasn't worked so far. <laughs> it always keeps on getting bigger. I see. Cool. Uh, so I'm looking here. Uh, there's a there's a Q and A button down at the bottom, and uh, maybe we should spend a, a few minutes on yeah. that. About ten minutes back. Uh, let me see. Uh, so one question was, and maybe neither of us are experts on this, but what areas do you see as the most productive uses for AI in medicine? I guess for me, the, you know, the most exciting things are like these uh, protein folding of, uh, you know, maybe we could really understand what's going on there and do uh, drug discovery. Uh, there's certainly a lot of stuff around using medical records uh, and there, some of it is AI oriented. I think a lot of it is kind of policy oriented of, uh, of how we, uh, how are we allowed to use these uh, records? How do you respect privacy and weigh that off against uh, being able to share anonymized versions and, and, uh, and gather information from that? And I think that's a, a subject that as a society, we haven't really addressed yet. I, I think we, we saw the benefit of privacy, but we didn't really uh, see as much the benefit of being able to share information and learn from it. I agree. I, uh, I guess my answer to this question, which would probably be the same answer to many other similar questions, is um, instead of thinking um, of how AI can solve a problem, let's think about how AI can empower a human to solve the problem better. So in this case, it would be, if you're a doctor, what is the additional information that might come to bear when you're making a diagnosis um, for a particular situation and what are the how can ai help with that uh, with getting you the right information uh when you need it um yeah and here's a question uh, what's your take on learning ai through grad school versus uh self-learning through the various MOOCs and open courseware and and so on I think they're disjoint. So the stuff that you you can learn, you should learn everything you can from MOOCs and, and get familiar with all the tools and the concepts. But in grad school, your purpose is to go and 
and do something new that nobody has done before, at least if you're doing a PhD. And, and grad school is the way that you uh, go through that process of learning how to do research, uh, doing that research and publishing it and uh, contributing in that way to the world. So there, there, there are different skills. What do you think, Peter? Yeah, I, I think I think that's true. The, the goal of grad school is to be able to contribute uh, at that level. Uh, but I'm wondering if, uh, if you could do that uh, on your own. Uh, I think it's harder to do because uh, you don't, um, but I think if maybe, if you had, maybe you would require the right peer group, right? Because I think grad school is two things. Uh, you take classes and you learn stuff, uh, but you also learn by being part of a community uh, for your thesis advisor and the other faculty and your fellow grad students and so on. And it's really from them and not from the classwork that you learn to be a contributor in the field. Uh, so I think you would need that uh, more than you would need, you know, sure, there's, there's probably a MOOC that substitute for the class you would have taken, but you need a substitute for that sense of community. And, and maybe you can get that in some of these uh, venues. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, places like uh, Kaggle, there's a lot of uh, discussion going back and forth on, on how to do these things. So that, so that might, might serve as an opportunity, but, but you got to get that sense of, of community somewhere. Yeah. And it's not the course work. I remember one of my experiences from grad school was looking at the faculty and realizing how completely, they completely disagree with each other uh, <laughs> about their approach, uh, different approaches to AI. And I think just seeing that at a very young age and realizing that, you know, there's no absolute truth and, and here's one school of thought and here's another school of thought and sort of creating your own point of view about, about the field. Uh, that's an important experience. Now you could argue that you could just do this on steroids on Twitter, but uh, there's something different about doing it sitting in a, in a conference yeah. room and listening to seeing uh, two professors do it out with each other. Yeah. Let's see. Uh... So here's the related question. I, I'm a self-taught programmer. What's your recommendation on uh, how to get into AI? I guess my recommendation would be uh, find some project to, uh, to work on, either uh, one that you a challenge that you come up with yourself or you know, find some open source project that could use a volunteer and, and just get involved with it uh, and then figure out what you're missing. And, and catch up on, on that. Uh, but uh, I think it should be driven first by a need rather than trying to uh, read everything and take every course. Right. Some of the Kaggle competitions are actually yeah. a good way to see, you know, uh, they actually come from real needs and, and you get up to speed on a lot of the techniques. So, yeah. Uh, Uh, and here's one we touched on a bit. Uh, how can AI help fight disinformation? Machines become smarter, but humans seem to believe all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. So, so misinformation is an interesting uh, is an interesting creature. Um, so, suppose somebody posts some uh, some sort of post on on a social media uh, platform. Now, the, the social media company should not be the one deciding what is true and false in the world, right? That would, <laughs> that would give it, uh, them a bit too much power, uh, even more than they have today. So what, what is typically done is there are third-party fact checkers. These are actual companies that, that have trained people who go and, and read the literature and, and drill down to see what, what is true and what is false. So the, the way uh, misinformation is treated in, say, in Facebook is 
we would send this post to a third party fact checker and, um, and, and rely on them to, to say yes or no. Now, the problem with that is that it, they're humans and they're, they're, they're not as fast as AI, right? So, um, so a lot of the effort that, that is done with AI is to say, when we see a new post, is this similar enough to something that was already sent to a, three, uh, a third party and we got the answer from? And a lot of misinformation is just small variations on previously seen uh, misinformation. So if you can actually do that semantic match very efficiently, you'll save a lot of the, a lot of the work that you're sending to humans. So that's where AI comes in. But trying to decide what's true in the world that's AI can help to, to bring relevant facts to the third party fact checker, uh, you know, give them articles that, that might have bearing on, on what they're trying to decide. Um, but, um, but that's, that's where AI helps. Okay. Uh, looks like we're out of time. Is that true? Yeah, Bidu is going to yeah. throw us off the stage. That's great. Oh, no, thank you. That was an amazing, amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, and Alon, I uh, uh, deep apologize. Please accept my apologies. I was nervous. I don't know why I kind of talked about Pilar when I should have said something about you. Uh, you know, we actually worked together on structured data. We did. We did. <laughs> we did. Uh, and so, um, you know, I've always had the belief that uh, one day structured data is going to play a key role, uh, you know, regardless of what happens in the, in the neural network world. And I think that, will you know, hopefully that will bear out to be true. Thank you both so much. That was amazing. Actually, I think that was our most amazing, uh, you know, uh, discussion to date uh, in, in these webinars. Uh, hopefully that won't be the last. Uh, and uh, you know, any other questions which come up from any of the, uh, you know, any of the attendees, so we'll forward to you. Also, um, you guys can follow uh, Alon on Twitter. I don't believe Peter is on Twitter. Is that right, Peter? No, you know, I do my writing uh, a thousand pages at a time, not 140 <laughs> characters. Uh, okay. I couldn't, couldn't quite fit in Twitter. Okay, I uh, would love to like, uh, you know, uh, hear about your, uh, the upcoming book. And uh, you think, I, I think you can follow him on LinkedIn now. So follow Peter on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah LinkedIn works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, hope to see you guys again. I mean, I actually really enjoyed that. Um, thanks. Uh, awesome. and, yeah. And uh, hey, and the next, actually, we want to like do a quick raffle. Uh, Bill is going to do a raffle for all the attendees. We're going to be giving out AirPods uh, for the lucky winner. And then follow that up with Colin, who's going to do an introduction to uh, someone we're collaborating with, uh, Frank Hutter, who is uh, one of the world's renowned researchers in AutoML. Thank you.